Hey guys, with uh, Minneapolis burning, now might be a good time to talk about anarcho-tyranny and fake news and why the cops aren't really on your side. So Samuel Francis defined anarcho-tyranny as um, an armed dictatorship without rule of law or a government that zealously regulates the lives of its citizens but doesn't fulfill the protective role of law. And a friend of mine also calls this Tyrannarchy, so anarcho-tyranny, tyrannarchy, take your pick. Um, but some classic examples of this are, you know, grooming gangs, mostly of Pakistani origin, uh, run amok in Great Britain. And they, you know, rape, pimp, and traffic white women and girls. The authorities turn a blind eye to this, but if you say anything against it on Twitter, you know, oh boy, they'll be around in a hurry to kick in your door. In America, pedophiles, you know, child rapists, receive ridiculously light sentences, often only a couple of years. And, you know, some people justify this by pointing out that a lot of them are killed in prison. And this is true. But, you know, in this case, we're not really doing justice. We're, we're relying on low lives and, um, you know, criminals to, to do the full measure of justice that we won't do through our justice system. But on the other hand, whenever some vigilante catches one of these assholes and goes to town on him, they throw the book at him. So you can get a much stiffer sentence in most cases for going vigilante on a child rapist than you actually get for being a child rapist. Um, you know, at Charlottesville in 2017, there was a protest, a variety of right-wing groups gathered to protest, um, the removal of Confederate statues, and there was a counter-protest, uh, and the cops showed up to, um, violate the First Amendment constitutional rights of the permitted protesters, which courts had already said they had to uphold. Uh, by shutting down the protest, and they pushed the protesters out of the protest area, didn't offer them any protection from the counter-protesters, but actually pushed them into the counter-protesters, which guaranteed a brawl. And then, um, you know, one car of protesters trying to leave the area was surrounded and mobbed by angry, armed, violent leftists and minorities and um, when, when the car tried to force its way through the crowd, um, several were injured and one died, although it's not clear if that was even related. Um, but the driver of that car received a stiff sentence and several other protesters at that uh, rally were charged with various lesser crimes. Um, but as far as I know, none of the counter protesters were. Even though even the official investigation, the official report, you know, emphasizes that the cops really failed. They really fell down on the job on this one, you know, or perhaps on purpose. Perhaps it wasn't so much failure, but, um, you know, orchestrated in some way. You know, and in, and in Minneapolis and other cities, you know, cops will wander around randomly harassing occasionally assaulting and even killing petty criminals, suspected petty criminals or unlucky innocents. Uh, you know, but when they're really needed, like in a riot, they're nowhere to be found, even if their own behavior provoked the riot. You know, Minneapolis police have been saying it's too risky for them to confront looters and they're just hunkering down in their precincts or abandoning, abandoning them to the crowds. They still have time to arrest shopkeepers for shooting looters, however, which is another instance of anarcho-tyranny. They won't keep law and order. They won't maintain order. They won't enforce the law, but they will come down on you if you do. Uh, in Baltimore, after police, some of them black, serving a black mayor, killed a black man as part of a racist white conspiracy to disproportionately target the black community. They then stood back and let Baltimore riot. In the words of the mayor, to give those who wish to destroy space to destroy. 
or a space to do that. Um, that's anarcho tyranny. That's tyrannarchy. So for the past 19 years, a federal agency called the TSA has routinely wasted billions of dollars and years of our time on elaborate security theater that routinely fails to stop simulated threats from getting through and has never stopped an actual terrorist attempt. It's basically just a costly charade to make you feel violated and put upon, but it doesn't actually make you any safer. I mean, the examples go on and on. Um, and when I was a libertarian, I hated cops for their manifold abuses and misconducts. When I started to become more nationalist and right wing, that started to moderate somewhat. Never to the point that I actually liked cops or would have said anything like blue lives matter. But if anything seems true, it's that a diverse multicultural society requires more aggressive policing than a homogenous one. A police state is just one price we pay for allowing certain groups to live among us. Just tally it up as another cost of diversity and multiculturalism. Now, I don't like diversity and I don't like cops, but as long as we have diverse groups, it seems like it would be nice if we also had some cops to keep them from getting totally out of line. Uh, but you know what? You can never trust the cops to be there when they're needed most. And that's true for two primary reasons. First, cops always get their marching orders from hostile elites and institutions. Most of these problems that would make us even want cops ultimately derive from entrenched and long-standing treason at the top levels. The highest ranking individuals in the most powerful institutions have all got parasitic and malicious agendas that the majority of the public quite sensibly will not support. And by golly, they're going to cram those agendas down our throats, even if they have to replace us with a never-ending deluge of cheaper and cheaper replacement voters from the turd world or pander to and farm hostile, dependent, parasitic urban underclasses. And that sets the tone, dictates the priorities for every level below them, you know, right down to the cops on the street. And that'll always be true until we deal with these treasonous elites, you know, despite the police, over the best efforts of the police to protect their chain of command. And, you know, the second reason is cops are lazy and self-serving. Their behavior can usually be predicted just by what would be easiest or most convenient for them, personally, at any given instant. So is it easier to de-escalate a situation gracefully using diplomacy and the credible threat of force, or just flex and smack people around gratuitously? Is it easier to use targeted and appropriate force or just go apeshit on people? Well, with a high degree of probability, that predicts what they're going to do. But when that kind of behavior inevitably provokes a riot, is it easier to just hunker down and wait for it to blow over or get out there and actually maintain order and protect property? You know, again, the easy, what's the easier course seems to predict what they're most likely to do. Which is easier, preventing or solving actual crimes or padding departmental revenue by writing a bunch of bullshit tickets? Which is easier? That seems to predict their behavior with a high degree of accuracy. But I mean, everybody's lazy and self-serving to an extent. Why is this so out of control with cops? Even in the exercise of what may still be necessary or helpful duties. Well, it's because they essentially have no competition and no accountability. I mean, the competition is an easy thing to understand. Cops have a monopoly on the use of violence to enforce the law. What happens to monopolies? They get careless and unresponsive. A monopoly on shoes will make shitty shoes. A monopoly on clothes will make shitty clothes. You know, a monopoly on bread will make shitty bread. Just because doing something poorly is easier than doing it well. Uh, and you can't go to another source 
So it, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You know, the monopoly aspect also explains police priorities. A pedophile is not a direct threat to police or courts. So they're lackadaisical about punishing child rape. But a vigilante is a direct threat to police and courts because it shows someone else can supply the justice they won't and undercuts their legitimacy. A riot is not much direct threat to police. It's a bit of a bother. You know, it means a bit of overtime, but that has benefits for them as well as costs. But a riot actually increases demand for authority. A riot gets the people who aren't rioting clamoring for police protection, clamoring for police intervention, which may or more likely may not be forthcoming. But people defending themselves and their businesses in a riot is a direct threat to police because it shows that there is another way, a way where police aren't really necessary and that terrifies them more than anything. Now, as for accountability, that's non-existent for a few reasons, but mainly because we're counting on it to be self-imposed. You know, there are cops to police cops, but they're lazy and self-serving too. Would it be easier to keep a close eye and a short leash on their own or not? Right, so they don't. Then there's the fact that cops are all buddy-buddy with the prosecutors. They work together day in and day out to press charges against citizens on a variety of grounds, you know, real or cooked up. Then, when a cop steps out of line, you have to count on a prosecutor to bring charges against a friend and colleague. In England, they have private prosecution. Anyone can press charges against anyone. But in America, since colonial times even, we've had public prosecution. In some jurisdictions, the victim of a crime can file a writ of mandamus to force a prosecutor to press charges, but in general, it's up to prosecutorial discretion. Even the mayor of Minneapolis, a man who looks disquietingly like Justin Trudeau, and echoes all the fake news narratives, um, had to rely on the district attorney to bring charges against the cop he wanted to throw under the bus. The district attorney dragged his feet, saying that there was evidence that didn't tend to support conviction, but finally brought charges. Someone in Minneapolis was saying that this is the fastest they've ever brought charges against a cop, but it still didn't seem very fast. The other thing is cops are given a lot of power and responsibility and a lot of benefit of the doubt. It's understood that their work puts them in dangerous situations where they have to make tough calls and it's not really considered appropriate to second guess a bad call from the sidelines or after the fact. You know, if a normal citizen like you or like me um, kicked in someone's door looking for drugs and then shot the occupants for defending themselves, and it turned out there were no drugs and we didn't even have the right address, it'd be an open and shut murder conviction. We wouldn't even get past, well, I kicked in the door looking for drugs and the judge would be all over us with questions like, why were you there? Why were you doing that? Um, who gave you that authority? We wouldn't have a good answer for any of those questions, but cops do. They can just say, it's my job and you did, your honor. And, um, you know, sorry, mistakes happen, and I feared for my life. And that's usually good enough. That usually flies. Should it be their job, though? That's a good question, and I'll come back to it later. You know, anytime something like this happens, if it involves a black person, um, the fake news slots it into a grand narrative where cops all over the country are systematically killing black people just because they're black. They suggest or imply, or sometimes outright state, this narrative by focusing on certain cases that reinforce the narrative and glossing over others that don't. If it's a white cop and a black suspect, they always emphasize this over and over. In other cases, not so much. If you're familiar with names like Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, and now George Floyd, but not names like Kelly Thomas, Daniel Shaver, Justine Damon, then you've fallen prey to this narrative. 
even I've fallen prey to some extent. You know, I know there are more white examples, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. And when I went to search for them, pretty much all I got were the black results. So data compiled from a variety of sources shows that cops in America kill on the order of about a thousand people per year. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but uh, right about a thousand per year. Now this is hundreds of times more than in comparable advanced nations. Is this necessary? Is it helpful? A lot of these killed are low lives who certainly won't be missed. But a lot of them are also innocents killed by mistake or overzealousness. For the most part, I think it would almost certainly be better if the killing that needed to be done, and in principle we could do a lot more of it, was done with more deliberation and due process and transparency instead of chaotically and ad hoc in the streets. Now of those approximately 1,000 who police kill each year, data shows that more are white than black, which means that blacks are at least somewhat underrepresented or whites are overrepresented as victims of police killings because blacks actually do about half of the serious crime. Studies that attempt to control for the circumstances or other variables usually find that blacks are no less likely to survive a police encounter than whites or Hispanics. Uh, other studies have found that white officers are less likely to kill non-white suspects than non-white officers are. So white officers are less likely to kill non-white suspects than non-white officers. So the fake news media narrative just doesn't stand up to serious scrutiny. Something's obviously going on with cops, but it doesn't seem to be that. It doesn't seem to be a systematic campaign of mass murder targeted at a particular demographic. Um, but that doesn't stop them from trotting out that narrative whenever it suits them. You know, George Floyd had barely even stopped breathing and they were already making sure we knew he was black and the officer who choked him out with his knee was white, as if that proved ipso facto that race was the main motivation. And bringing up the same literal handful or two other cases that this whole flimsy narrative rests upon, some of which have themselves fallen apart under scrutiny. I mean, that doesn't appear to be the case here. There doesn't appear to be any reasonable explanation uh, for this particular cop's actions. But it's still a leap from there to racism and from there to all cops are racist. Although I'd be surprised if a lot of them weren't just because of what they inevitably see. So the results were predictable. Blacks in Minneapolis and a few other cities rioted. Businesses were looted. Televisions, athletic shoes, and bottles of alcohol were redistributed to long-suffering blacks as compensation for decades of targeted mass murder, according to the fake news. <coughs> I don't really know why the fake news decided <clears throat> that now would be a good time to instigate race riots. Maybe they think it'll help them somewhat in the fall. Maybe they're just too high on their own bullshit and they don't know how to turn it off. You know, I don't know. But I'm not actually too butthurt about it. Maybe you can tell my sympathies don't exactly lie with the cops. Nor do my sympathies lie with the businesses that have been looted and burned. You know, most of them are big businesses, they're corporate businesses, and exemplars of woke capitalism that have virtue signaled in the past about welcoming diversity and, you know, reinforcing blacks' victim complexes. And my sympathies certainly don't lie with ordinary shit libs in shit lib cities. I mean, let their cities burn, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't have much sympathy for the rioters or looters, but as long as they're going after police and woke capitalism and demonstrating to conservatives who are still stuck on egalitarianism and civic nationalism, the futility of trying to integrate them, into a civilized society or appease their unquenchable sense of grievance and entitlement, I don't really mind. I mean, I ha even have a very little, very little bit of grudging respect for the vigor with which they defend their perceived interests and go after what they want. I mean, if our people had even half of that, we wouldn't have half of the problems we have.
And that's one reason why, for example, the cops in Europe won't go after unruly Islamic invaders, but they will go after whites who criticize them or express disapproval of them. Because, you know, the Muslims will rally and they will push back against any encroachment on their prerogatives, but the whites won't. So that's something we could learn from them. And there's a second reason too, which is that cops always get their marching orders from hostile treasonous elites with anti-white, anti-Western agendas. And that isn't going to change until we change it. You know, over and against the most strenuous objection of cops, whose job is not to let us change it. So what's the solution to all this? Well, here are some of my recommendations. First, you know, let's knock cops off their pedestal. No special powers for them. And any powers that they have, we have too. Cops don't need to be a privileged enforcer class with special powers and immunities. They can just be regular citizens who, to the extent that we have any cops at all, just happen to specialize in a job that any one of us may also do should the need arise. So fewer cops, less power for cops, and more power for citizens, including power to employ violence to maintain law and order. We've abdicated our authority to maintain civilization to an unaccountable cast of enforcers for too long, and they haven't conducted themselves well, so it's time to take it back. Second, reintroduce private prosecution. Let citizens press charges themselves against other citizens or against officials. The courts, with judges and juries presiding, still get to decide the outcomes, of course, but prosecutions that weren't formally practical would become practical, and accountability that wasn't formally forthcoming would be forthcoming. You know, and as for fake news, incitement to riot on false pretexts is an act of criminal aggression and grounds for prosecution and punishment. So combine that with private prosecution, and we can deal with the fake news. And finally, we need to separate from the uncivilized hordes. No more forced integration. No more false parasitic equality propaganda. No more grievance and entitlement politics. Peaceful separation or unpeaceful conflict and war 